So um, I'm here just to give, like, as far as I understand, a general overview about the optic lobe and the sensory input that is collected within the optic lobes. So what different photoreceptor subtypes are doing and so on and so forth. So um, please feel free to ask questions uh, whenever you have a question during the talk. And also I would like uh, in the end to like, if you have questions regarding the cells you're looking at and fly wire, you're uncertain about cell types or what they could do, um, I would be happy if we have like a discussion afterwards or even during during the, the presentation, if you find like your favorite cell type within the, in the presentation. Okay, so um, the Drosophila compound eye, right, is this repetitive unit. If you look from the outside, you see all these little repetitive individual structures. And even if you like cut through this outer layer of the eye, the so-called retina, you can see actually these individual repetitive units, right? And these units are called omatidia. So these are the individual units that make up the compound ion within the retina. And each omatidium consists of eight, in total, eight photoreceptors. So, and they are numbered R1 to R8. And these photoreceptors have a structure, which is here, this dark, darkish structure, which are the so-called rhabdomeres. And within these rhabdomeres, the actual rhodopsins are located, which are the proteins, which are light sensitive. So the substrate for vision, the, the protein substrate for vision in, in insects and in, in, in particular here. So, and if we make a little schematic out of this individual omatidium, we, and we can, also look of, of the schematic on the side view. We actually see this is this elongated long structure with like individual lenses on each individual omatidium. And these rhabdomeres are actually really, really long elongated structures. And these, um, what we call outer photoreceptors or one to R6 are located within this yeah, outer ring. And then we have inner photoreceptors R7 and R8 which are actually stacked on top of each other. So if we go through this cross section here, do you see my cursor by the way, or should I? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. We have the R7 photoreceptor on top of R8. And here is just another uh, simple illustration of an individual omatidium, right? You have these units of photoreceptors, these rhabdomeres in the actual retina. And if we look at the outer ones, R1 to R6, we can actually ask what kind of rhodopsin do these photoreceptors express? And we see all these photoreceptors express actually the same rhodopsin, rhodopsin 1, which is uh, sensitive to light in the far UV, UV-ish um, spectrum. So they all, all these outer photoreceptors should be able to detect the same wavelength. So shouldn't be able to discriminate color and they're also located in like a um, in a ring structure, right? These are the outer photoreceptors. So people always uh, thought of these as the clear uh, neuronal substrate, receptor substrate for motion vision. So the substrate for motion detection. And um, coming um, now a little detour about like this arrangement of photoreceptors, right? You have these photoreceptors of an individual omatidium all sitting under one individual lens. So, and now if we think about these individual omatidiums sitting next to each other, and um, we actually um, run into a problem that actually these uh, out of photoreceptors in one individual uh, omatidium, they're actually not seeing the same point in space just based on the optics, but they see different points in space. Meaning that uh, one of the, for example, our two photoreceptors in one of our tedium through optics sees a point over here, whether uh, our five photoreceptors on the other side of the same other tedium sees a point over here as eight. And then the inner photoreceptors would be sitting in the middle of the omatidium would here see point B. 
so actually the what we always consider an individual pixel uh, on my tedium representing an individual pixel and you have this repetitive unit of individual uh, pixels um, in the fly eye doesn't hold true for these autoreceptors at least from this uh, of this um, if you look at at the arrangement of the raptomeres in the martidium. So, um, but I can tell you in the brain, actually this still holds true. So um, the fly actually goes through a, uh, a quite fascinating developmental program to correct for this um, mix up of visual points within the omatidium of the outer photoreceptors so that within the optic uh, lobe and lamina and medulla, they are again representing individual points in space. So if you now think about all the photoreceptors of the retina uh, within the retina, leaving the retina, the axons leaving the retina, going into the lamina, they actually don't end up within the same column, or as we say in the lamina, cartridges, but they spread out in different cartridges, neighboring cartridges in a very stereotypic pattern. And this occurs throughout the whole eye. If you look at the, the opposing um, uh, way at, at this, and though uh, if you so if you're looking from the lamina, looking at an individual lamina cartridge, you can actually see that all these photoreceptor axons of the outer photoreceptors, they uh, come from neighboring omatidiums. And this particular pattern um, actually secures um, the, uh, the retinotopy of the eye, meaning that all of these photoreceptors ending up in one cartridge within the lamina are all these photoreceptors looking at the same point in space. So if we quickly go back here, right, it would be photoreceptors that all look, for example, from neighboring cartridges that are all looking at A. So this would be point A, and then neighboring would, would be looking at B, would collect from other neighboring materials. And through that mechanism, which is called neural superposition, we ensure that within the lamina, we actually have a pixel by pixel neighboring point representation of space. And this then can be transferred through the whole of the globe uh, up until the local update. Okay, this was just a little detour on how you can secure uh, uh, pixel by pixel representation within the optic lobe. So um, motion vision, right? I said this is the prime example of motion vision. And actually, um, we what was known for quite some time by now is that we have these uh, two cell types, T4 and T5. I'm pretty sure you most likely already stumbled across them in Flywire. And these are like large populations of cells and they have their, um, so T4 has their dendrites within the last layer of amygdala, T5 in the lobula, and all the axons end in like these four distinct layers within the lobular plate. And what people did is they did functional imaging studies to where they were able to look at the um, activity of these cells in living flies. And what they did is they actually showed um, moving patterns. So patterns that would go from left to right, right to left, up and up or down, which are here indicated by these arrows. And if you, what you see then is that actually these individual layers and therefore the individual T4 and T5 cell types are actually selective for particular directions of motion. So these are direction selective motion detectors. And this make people really, really exciting. So these are the first cells actually that, that are able to tell just by the activity, what kind of motion and which direction of motion was perceived by the animal, which is like super critical. And um, so this was the one. And then for a long time, actually, there was like um, computational work that had like different models, how this could be um, actually computed, right? These it, it doesn't seem so trivial how you could make a cell uh, motion or, or direction select. So there, this is actually going back to the 70s. You can, I can try to run through this. So um, here, these 
individual shells are representing individual visual units. So this would be more or less in, in, in Drosophila or Matidia. And you would have a moving object going from left to right. And the idea is, one computational idea that there was is that you need a delay and a multiplication step. So if a moving bar is coming from left to right, at the first omatidium, the signal would be delayed, and then the second it wouldn't. So that um, after passing through both omatidium, actually the signal would coincide within the multiplication step and you would get a, a high signal, right? So it would say, okay, I see a movement from left to right. And this is then called preferred direction. And the null direction, would, which is like the opposite direction where you wouldn't expect any sensitivity, otherwise it wouldn't be uh, direction selective, right? You have a not delayed signal and a delayed signal. So they actually would never coincide. So the multiplication step would always result in a zero because you have a non-signal with the signal multiply applied will, will have, or always give, give zero. So this was like uh, a computational model. And now people were now really keen to actually find the cells that input into T4 and T5 to see how such a model, for example, could be implemented to, to generate or to uh, give T4, T5 this uh, direction selectivity property. So, and this, it was like one of the driving forces in, in Drosophila uh, connectomics for a long time. And one very famous data set was this so-called seven column data set where people just looked at the like seven column chunk within the medulla, only medulla. You may um, recognize these cells, some of you. Um, these are MI1 cells. And through multiple iterations of like looking at medulla and lobular and lobular columns, uh, people were able to come up with a more or less complete connectome of the core cells within the motion uh, selective um, pathway. And there's so-called on, on and off motion pathways. T4 is an on motion and T4 is an off motion pathway, uh, meaning either you react to increase in, in light or decrease, so a black bar moving or a light bar moving across the space. Hey, I can I pop in with a quick a quick question? Yeah, so sure. uh, just to make, there's a question in chat to make sure that I understand each A, B, C, D type of T4 slash T5 are specific to the motion that they detect. Exactly, so let me go, can I, no? Exactly. So uh, now I'm not quite certain if they're correctly aligned, but here in this, if they, they correspond, right, the green being this upper layer within the lobular plate, then T4A would be selective for motion going from left to right. Whether the neighboring column, the T4B or T4B um, column would be right to left motion sensitive. Exactly. So each individual cell type is selective to one cardinal direction of motion. Okay, uh, where did we stop? I was here, uh, exactly. So these are uh, people looked at the cell types, individual cell types, counted their synapses and actually um, found the, the major players. And now people are still, uh, or people are now discussing um, how actually this connection, interconnection between all these cells could then lead up and to the to the actual motion selectivity in T4 and T5 or directional selectivity in T4 and T5. And here's just a one very um, interesting result from these studies is, um, for example, for T4, here are um, four different T4s, A, B, C, and D. You can actually see that their dendrites are, um, these are all coming from the same column, uh, right? In the medulla, that the dendrite orientation is also uh, in the more or less in the direction of selectivity. So T4A, which is left right motion, right, has a, a horizontal uh, dendrite orientation, T4B uh, opposing horizontal orientation and these are vertical orientations for C and D. And you can actually see 
that there's differential input within individual T4 dendrites. So we always have in the center of the dendrite, we have input from MI1, quite strong input from MI1. And we know, right, these are single columnar neurons, MI1s. So all in these neighboring columns, also MI1s exist, but the strongest input the T4 cell gets is within the center. Same is true for MI4 and MI9. They're all single columnar neurons. So they exist in each individual column. Although only ex uh, existing in all columns, this particular T4A only receives MI1 input at the base of the dendrite, whether the T4B also receives uh, MI4 input at the base, but it's because of the di differential orientation of the dendrites, it's on the other side here, right? And same is true for MI9, but in the reversed fashion, meaning that MI9 input is always at the tips of the dendrite, where MI4 is at the base of the dendrite. So you have differential input um, from within the dendrites of uh, T4As. And this gave people like ideas about how you could actually generate uh, direction selectivity by differential input at different regions along the direction of selectivity of a T4 dendrite. Um, yeah, but uh, so far this was only always done for small volumes of like a few columns. But he, now in Flywire, people actually have the possibility or you guys have now the possibility to look at all T4s, all T5s and try to understand if there's actually regional differences uh, within the eye. Uh, maybe there's something very special about the ventral visual space um, that uh, leads to a different dendritic orientation of, of the T4s or T5s. So these are all questions that now can be answered by you guys in, in Flywire. Okay, so this was only now about right, the outer photoreceptors, a one, two, R6, that are uh, involved in uh, motion vision and direction selective vision. Uh, what about these? Uh, Inner photoreceptors, right? We talked about R1 to R6, but there are still these central R7 and R8 photoreceptors. Uh, what, what are they good for? And one thing that we already discussed in the beginning is, right, they're sitting right on top of each other. So there's very, it's hard for at least for R7 and R8 within the same omatidium to do comparison between different points in space because they're literally sitting on top of each other, always looking at, same, at the same point in space. So they must be comparing something different than spatial information. And if we um, look at, at, at their Rhodopsin expression, we actually see differences. And we see differences between omatidium throughout the whole omati uh, throughout the whole retina. So there is a particular omatidium subtype, which is called pale, where R7 expresses the rhodopsin 3 and R8 expresses the rhodopsin 5, and another subtype called yellow, where R7 expresses rhodopsin 4 and R8 expresses rhodopsin 6. So these photoreceptors look at the same point in space, but are selective to different um, wavelengths. So these are prime candidates, of course, for color vision. And if you look at the whole retina, you can actually see that there's a stochastic pattern of, of these um, of these omatidium subtypes, which is also quite is interesting. If you uh, think about the downstream circuitry, whenever there should be a pale or yellow specific circuitry, um, this these cells, yellow and pale cells, um, within the optic lobe need to find the photoreceptors, the photoreceptor terminals of pale and yellow uh, subtypes, which are stochastically specified within the retina. So this is also an interesting developmental challenge to think about. So as I mentioned, prime candidate for color vision, but interestingly, and that's like where, where our main interest uh, lays, is there's a third subtype where R7 and I both express the same rhodopsin. So this is 
interesting because they're looking at the same point in space, but they have the same root option. So therefore they are, shouldn't be able to do any color comparison because the root option have, have the same wavelength. And they're also localized at a very narrow rim area uh, around the whole retina. And these photoreceptors, um, they are able to detect the e-vector orientation of light. So um, I probably won't go into the details, but uh, actually light, skylight um, has is slightly polarized and there's a polarization pattern around the sun. And these photoreceptors are actually able to read out the orientation of the e-vector, so the plane of, of polarization of, uh, of light, skylight. And this is um, very helpful for navigational decisions. If you know um, how the light is polarized within the sky, you can use this very much as a compass, as, as people know where the sun is, right? This always, a sun is a clear landmark that you can use to navigate. The same is true for the polarization pattern within the sky. And these specialized uh, photoreceptors in the so-called dorsal rim area, DRA, are like the neuronal substrate for polarization detection. Okay, so um, maybe just a few words to, for color vision, uh, regarding color vision. So um, I would say there's considerably less known about color vision than for motion vision in Drosophila. Um, we know about the photoreceptors, that these photoreceptors actually uh, within the same omatidium, they actually have synapses uh, onto each other. So there are seven make synapses onto the R8 and R8 onto R7. And you can actually see them also in flyby. And this um, is called reciprocal inhibition. And this results actually in a color opponency already within the photoreceptor. So the one photoreceptor, considering here, uh, in a pale omatidium, the R7 white, would be highly sensitive to wavelength in, um, in the UV range, so very active, um, where the R8 is um, inactive or actually gets inhibited through the reciprocal inhibition from the same R7 photoreceptor, and vice versa in the more higher wavelength range, where R8 is super sensitive. And through this high sensitivity and this inhibitor, inhibitory synapses on R7, R7 gets inhibited. So we have a, a bi-directional signal um, for these photoreceptors. So this we knew, their color opponent. And then uh, from light microscopic studies and early um, uh, connectomic studies, actually also the seven uh, medulla column connectome data set, people knew that there are the one of the prime uh, downstream targets of R7 are the so-called DM8 cells. And for R8, it's TM5C, or at least the TM5 cell types. But it was always tricky, right? Because we have different um, omatidial subtypes, and there's actually quite a lot of variation between the different columns in these like little seven-column data set. So, and I think this is also quite beneficial for Flyway because you have all the columns of the whole eye so you can look at all the individual photoreceptors and then make a comparison between how variable are they? Are they actually, can we tell based on the connectivity if a photoreceptor is a coming from a pale omatidium or from a yellow omatidium? Okay, and polarization vision, I would say they were even less known. We were one of the first who, who published um, um, some light microscopic evidence about the prime synaptic targets of our dorsal rim photoreceptors. And we found that R7 has a dedicated uh, downstream cell as well as R8. And we were super happy actually when we found these cells in Flywire. So <laughs> this was a great relief that actually like what you published on a light microscopic uh, uh, level actually also holds true in the EM level. So these are the so-called DMDIA1 cells and these are the DMDRA2 cells. Maybe some of you have already seen them in Flyway and came across these cells. Okay, so um, now 
we can, I don't know for how long I'm already talking. Uh, either I can talk a little bit more about what we specifically did so far um, with the FAFB dataset, or uh, if people are more interested in like asking their questions and having a, a discussion, we can directly jump into the discussion. I didn't keep track of the time. It's 1040 right now. I don't know for how long. So Mala. this go, yeah, Amala is, I think she had to run. Um, no, but for how long Mala was talking. So if it's 25 minutes and people want to start the discussion, we can start the discussion. Otherwise I have like a few more slides about what we did so far. Yeah, maybe you could do the rest of your slides. Okay, great. So then, um, right, just putting this color vision and and, um, and polarization vision next to each other. Um, these are, we consider them modalities, right? Color and polarization. And we wanted, we actually wanted to have like a complete list of all the synaptic partners of these photoreceptors for pale, for yellow, and for dorsal rim photoreceptors. So all their downstream partners and upstream partners. And then write synaptic count as a proxy for synaptic strength. And what was lacking previously in the seven dollar column data set was there, first of all, there's no information about pale, yellow, um, these identities of these individual columns. And then write these seven columns are centered within the eye. So very far away from the dorsal rim area. So there's no dorsal rim information within the same data set. Uh, so as I mentioned, an incomplete EM data set. Also, the tracing that was done on this data set is quite variable, right? These seven columns are quite good annotated in their synapses. But if you try to look around these seven columns, the tracing is very incomplete. And also, it just cuts off at some point, right? And then just because things are cutting off in this data set, right? You cannot just follow all the cells to wherever they end, because the volume ends at a certain point, there are some, some interesting, we, we considered interesting um, misidentifications. So for example, you may know from uh, Fischbach, these DM7 cells, and they were quite happy in, in Takamura to find DM7 cells um, as well. And now going back to, uh, to the seven medalla column dataset, and flyway and comparing these cells, we actually think that Fischbach as well as Takamura misidentified the cells um, by missing their main external branch going to the central brain. So we think now that these are actually uh, metoneurons, but we can discuss this in the end a little bit more if you're interested. <laughs> and we can discuss, if you'd like to talk about Fischbach, we can talk hours about Fischbach and all these his different cell types. Um, okay, so we choose the FFB dataset. And actually, when we started this, um, Flyway didn't exist yet. <laughs> so there wasn't this great segmentation data. So what we actually did is we used a software tool called CatMate, which allowed us to manually trace all the neurons. So we needed to go through a slice and slice and slice of EM data and mark each individual cell. And if when we completed that, we needed to mark each individual synapse because the synapse uh, prediction data also didn't exist back then. And we actually did this in a great collaboration. So the, the Vanet lab that I'm from with the Riser lab. So Michael Riser, you may know him. He's one, one of the clear experts in the world of, on motion vision. So when I, I butchered something in the beginning about motion vision, and you're really confused about it, read any paper from Michael Reiser. He will nicely explain all the details about motion vision. Um, exactly. But they also had an interest of, uh, on these inner photoreceptors, the color vision photoreceptors, and we teamed up with them um, to trace photoreceptors for DIA pale and yellow columns. So in our approach was, we first wanted to have a map of all the individual columns so that we know where's the DIA, where are we at within the medulla space. So we traced all the MI1 neurons, which gave us this MI1 map. And then we still needed to identify pale and yellow columns 
And that's actually where um, Aya Shanian comes in. So uh, also highly recommended reading all the papers from Aya Shanian. Uh, if there's a cell that he doesn't know in the optic lobe, then nobody else knows about the cell type. He memorizes all the cells within the optic lobe. So he, he's the clear optic lobe hero. And he um, found the cell on a light microscopic level that has like these um, in magenta, these upward projections. So this is now light microscopy. You look at the medulla and these are the individual columns. And you can see actually that these upward projections are not in all columns, but in very few, or not very few, but in some columns, right? And if you then overlay a staining for a particular rhodopsin, which is uh, rhodopsin 6, which is expressed only in pale uh, photoreceptors, then you can actually see that they overlap nicely over, uh, sorry, pale. Uh, Rhodopsin 6 is yellow specific. And you, so these first three images, Rhodopsin 6 actually is in all the columns where there is no MI12. And then if you overlay a Rhodopsin 3 um, extra, um, staining for our seven photoreceptors, which are pale specific, you say a nice overlap of these upward projections. So these cells, these A, who are also called ME12 are actually a cell type specific to pale columns. And then we decided, okay, we need to find these cells in the EN dataset. And we found them. And basically mycorrhizal people found them. And now we can use the cell actually, or all three, there are three per optic lobe. And we can just look in which columns, in which MI1 columns, we find one of these upper projections. And then we have a clear estimation of of this, if this column is either a pale, if there's an upward projection, or if there's none, this must be a yellow column. And then um, we identified the dorsal rim photoreceptors based on actually the photoreceptors themselves, because they are a little bit, um, the R8 photoreceptors goes a little bit deeper in a deeper medal layer than for the rest of the metal. Okay. So our strategy was we had this map, we knew all the identities of all the individual columns, and we picked three dorsal rim columns and then mycorrhizal um, tools of four columns within the center of the eye to Yale to uh, pair columns. And then we traced out all the photoceptors and labeled all presynaptic and postsynaptic sites and identified all upstream partners uh, with one or more synapses. And then basically we got this whole list and I'm just trying to cut this short for a moment and show you this summary uh, of connectivity. So if you look at uh, our, in particular, our seven photoreceptors, we actually see that the majority of their output goes into these DMA cell types, which was already like shown in Takamugo, for example, in 2013, but there's also a lot of um, information flowing directly into the anterior optic tubercle, which is an optical glomeruli within the central brain, but also into the lobular. And uh, actually these, this arrow going to the anterior optic tubercle, these are the so-called metoneurons that I mentioned previously, which previously were ident misidentified, we believe as GM7 cells, because they had, their dendritic morphology within the medulla matches nicely them of, of, of the morphology of DM7, but they actually have a exon going all the way onto the interoptic tubercle. For dorsal rim photoreceptors, we again see a main DM output cell type, DMDA1, and then a lot of information directly going into the interoptic tubercle, also so-called Me2 cells or Me2 DIA cells because they're DIA specific. We actually quite made an effort to show that they're really only contacting dorsal rim photoreceptors. And if we look at the R8 photoreceptor, um, we see that a lot of information within the central eye for pair and yellow columns directly goes through TM cell types, TM20, TM5C, and to the lobula, where the R8 within the dorsal rim is really reduced in their connectivity. 
there is information going to the DMDRA two, uh, but literally or almost no uh, connectivity going to the lobular. And actually, um, what we when we looked at then in Flywire, so um, when we found all these cells in Flywire, we actually see that um, most of the information from the R8 photoceptors goes through DMDA 2s into DMDA 1s, which isn't shown in this figure. But we know now that actually DMDA 2s are upstream of DMDA 1s. And DMDA 1s are also upstream directly of these Me2 cells that are going to the anterior optic tubercle. So eventually, all the information from the dot rim will go into the anterior optic tubercle. And quite a lot of information from the central eye also will end up into the anterior optic tubercle. And this is um, where our main interest lay, lies in flywire. So we want to understand the circuit or the pathway from the eye to the anterior optic tubercle all the way into the central brain. And this pathway is called the anterior visual pathway, where we have all these meto neurons that synapse on so-called tubo neurons in the anterior optic tubercle. Tubo stands for tubercle, to bulb, uh, oops, um, neuron. And then eventually all these um, cells synapse on the so-called ring neurons, which are like uh, the main input into the central complex, which is like the main navigational center within the fly brain. Here's just an example of individual cells, right? We have a meto neuron, synapsin on a tubo neuron to a ring neuron. And we spent a lot of time trying to find all these meto neurons. And then based on their morphology and also on their upstream connectivity uh, to group them in different groups. And we think we, um, we actually have a, a little bit now of understanding how these different cell types may actually provide different modality information for the central complex. So for example, me to two neurons are the ones that are only contacted by dorsal rim photoreceptors. So these are cells that should provide polarization information to the central complex and other cells may uh, provide other modality specific information to the central complex. And that's what, what our prime focus is right now in Flywire to understand these different me two cell types. Okay, that's, that's it now. now. Now I'm gonna shut up and we can talk about your favorite cell types in Flyway. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> That's, it's crazy how complicated even just the eyes of a fly are. Yeah. It always I mean, blows my mind when you're talking about it. Like, yeah. it sounds simple. Oh, you can just see, but yet so many different pathways yeah. and elements of vision. Yeah, if you, if you like pass the first synapse of a photoreceptor, everything already gets super complicated. So <laughs> you can, yeah, really jumbled up. Um, well, if any of you guys have any specific questions, feel free to drop them in chat. Um, we do have two two questions that were submitted before the event started. So um, the first one was, what are the non-neuron structures in the brain? Um, yeah, Th that is a good question. So <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, many glia cells or yeah glia cells are the main other cells within the within the brain actually um that are non-neuronal cells mm -hmm. and i try to stay away from them basically just by the fact that they're like when your cell is fused to a glia cell it's always a real pain to to get the a nice proofreading of the cell yeah. so i'm always happy if i don't find any glia cell attach, attached to my cells and then um, maybe what else is there? There are so-called trachea. You may have found these in Flywire as well, which are uh, a com uh, comparable structure to our uh, blood vessels, right? We have blood vessels. Uh, insects have these uh, trachea, which are literally like air tubes going into all the tissue, uh, transporting O2s. Uh, um, yeah. Um, oh oxygen to, to the tissue. So these are the main cells that come uh, that I can think of right now. 
And within glia, there's some diversity, right? There are different glia types, and you have like sheeting glia, which is around the individual neuropeels. You have like certain supporting glia structures directly within the neuropeel. So there, there is some diversity, but I'm actually not a good glia expert. Okay, we have a, one more question here, uh, which is, would love to learn more about groups of interfacing neurons. For example, we know that the right and the RNL cells form a column that interlocks together. What other groups like this exist in the lobe? Yeah, I mean, I think I presented some today, right? Mm -hmm. We have the classical motion vision interlocking partners, so to say. So mm -hmm. on, on motion pathway, going from the lamina to the T4 neurons to, I can, let me bring this quickly up maybe. Uh, can I share that again? You could maybe even try to make some flywire links that showed sort of groups of yeah, that, that work that, together. Yeah. And we yeah, could share those uh, in the forum and email them out too. Yeah, I feel like that'd be an interesting way to look at them. Um, Right, these are the oops here. Uh, some I would say classical uh, partners. So you may have seen the pair of I don't have the morphology here right now in the presentation, but L1 to MI1 looks like a match made in heaven, right? The the L1 exon endings are like perfectly matched by the MI1 dendrites within the layer M1 and M5 within the medulla. And this, um, yeah, yeah, these are the basic on motion partners L1 going to MI1 and TM3 to TM4. And then you have right off motion pathway uh, L2 to TM1 and TM2. And then there's L3, which is contributes to both. And then um, this for motion with, and then I think you are actually at a very good point to find other canonical pathways, I would say. We always knew from Takamover, the seven column data set. Um, for color vision, we know these are the inner photoreceptors, so R7 and R8, which are ending within the medulla. And we knew their main output partner is DM8 for R, R, R7 and TM5C for the R7 cell type, but that's basically it. Uh, that is like published knowledge about color vision circuitry. So you guys are at the perfect point to, for example, look at all the DM8 cells and try to understand, are there actually differences between DM8? Is there such a thing as a pale specific DM8 and a yellow specific DM8? Same is true for team 5 c And then oh, obviously, what is downstream of DM8, right? We don't know where the DM8 information is actually going. Is it going to the lobula? Is there another cell in between and then it's going to the anterior optic tubercle? We don't think so. But right there's, there, there's way less known about the color vision circuitry. For the dorsal room, we actually um, worked out, um, I, th I think of like the major backbone of the pathway which is the R7 and R8 going into the so-called DMDRA cell types, DMDRA1 and 2, which are going into the um, Me2 DRA cell types, which all end up right in the uh, anterior visual pathway. So for the polarization vision, I think this is uh, already quite clear where, where information flows. That's really cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this intro to the optoglobes and sort of a summary of your research. It's really fascinating. Um, and I'll circle back with you in the middle afterwards and we can try to make some flywire links for people. Yeah, um, sure. While we have just two minutes left, I've got a I've got a really tiny set of slides that just has um a little progress update on where we are with Flywire and um, the effects of your proofreading. So um, you congratulations, everyone. First of all, 10,000 neurons, that's so crazy. We looked up the stats of iWire and since it launched in 2012, there have been 7,300 neurons mapped in iWire. So in just a few months of Flywire, it's blown past 
10 years of eyewire, which is wild. And of those 7,500, I think like 3,000 of them came from zebrafish, from Mystic. So really proper eyewire um, was even less than that. Um, so the 10,000 proofread neurons, that constitutes 12.5% of all the neurons that we think are in the fly brain. Uh, that I'm sorry, 12.5% of the neurons that have been proofread so far in all the flywire have been done by citizen scientists. So flywire has been around for um, since 2019 now. So just um, a group of 16 eyewires who have access to production have really made a big difference in the pace of this project and um, and you know this, this first whole brain connectome. Uh, so as these are these stats are as of yesterday, but of the 10,000 neurons that have been proofread, uh, 8,700 of them were unique, which means that 1,300 of those submissions were actually um, mostly branches added to cells that had previously been completed by other people in the data set. So um, all of these metrics are uh, good progress forward towards a, an accurate connectome. Um, and so the, the official way that we are tracking progress in the brain of the fly is by the percentage of presynaptic partners that are assigned to a proofread segment. So we're now at 50% in the optic lobe. So we're halfway there um, with, the, with the optic lobe. And our metric for being complete is when 95% of all the synaptic partners in the whole brain are assigned to a proofread segment. Um, so I just got, uh, you know, I got a few stats in here from Sven. Um, so where we are now on the on the left, this first graph you're seeing with the 46.8 thousand neurons with 100 over 100 synapses. This represents the central brain, um, and almost pretty much all of these have been proofread. Um, once we get sort of towards the end of this proofreading process, it's basically a bunch of orphan branches that are segments with synapses that are not assigned. So um, there's actually, this is from last week. So these 800 segments have probably been um, proofread by the, the tracers. Um, but yeah, so the, the central brain is complete. And um, there we think there are about 397 about 39,700 neurons um, in the optic lobe, and we limit it to neurons with over 100 synapses. Um, so this is kind of a, a snapshot of where we are. There in total in the brain are 77,000 segments that, um, that have over 100 synapses that have not been proofread. But as we get closer and closer, those segments get smaller and smaller, so we go faster. Um, and then this is just a cool little heat map that shows um, where the proofreading is happening. So the central brain is this section right here that's in red, that's almost 100% proofread here. Um, and then this is the optic lobe that we're working in, as you guys know, so you can actually see the, the citizen science progress here. Um, there's some also a little bit of effort going on in this lobe, but we're getting there. We're, we're right now 75.9% of all the synapses in the whole fly brain are assigned to proofread SEG IDs. So we're getting there. Um, I think our uh, our latest estimate is that it's going to take about four more months to finish the whole brain. So amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you all so much.